Hey everybody, Mike here with Hardware Canucks, and this is a video that I've been so excited to make, but at the same time, in the back of my head, I've sort of been dreading it too. Now, look, let me give you a little bit of a history lesson. Over the last 15 years of building PCs, I've done every single thing that's out there, but there's one thing that I haven't, and that is build a passive PC. Now, with the launch of the Noctua NHP1, this cooler that's been rumored for years and teased for probably even longer, I was finally inspired to sort of jump on that boat. And I said, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. But look, I'm a glutton for punishment. I always have to sort of like take it to the next level. So instead of building this PC in the largest case I could, which is easy, or just cutting a hole in a case, which is probably even easier, I decided to sort of take it to the next level and build it in an ITX chassis. Not only that, but instead of just using the IGP, I decided to use a discrete passively cooled GPU. Now in this video, I want to go into all the components, all the challenges that it came to selecting those components, build this thing and see if it actually works. Because at this point in time, I don't know if it's actually going to work. So we're gonna get into all of that right after a message from our sponsor. Well, 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 small package, but with a lot of responsibility. The new Lian Li SP750 power supply brings performance to the SFX space with a fully modular design and complementing low profile cables. The 750 watt 80 plus gold unit should satisfy most SFF needs, especially with a zero RPM mode under 40% load in this pretty elegant exposed aluminum housing. It's about the size, the power, and where it comes from. Check out the SP750 SFX power supply down below. Well, with that out of the way, let's just talk very, very quickly about the components that I selected because I sort of alluded to this in the introduction. It was a lot more challenging than I initially thought it would be, even with something like the Noctua NHP1 because this is designed for passive cooling. So a lot of the job is actually made for you, but that's what you think. But I wanna actually talk about what other challenges this thing brings up when it comes to just building it into an ITX system. Now, Noctua has a long list of best practices for running passive systems, and some of them are pretty obvious, like keeping an eye on ambient temperatures, and that certain high wattage CPUs just aren't compatible with this thing unless you decide to run a fan on it. The ironic thing here is that I'm actually going against a lot of Noctua's own guidelines that come with building a passive PC. So first of all, there's that ITX case. They recommend ATX or larger cases simply because there's more air volume in that case. Therefore, it takes longer to heat up and that air physically cools down a passively cooled system. So you want as much air volume as possible. The other thing is using that ITX motherboard. So ITX motherboards have a ton of components in relatively close proximity. That component density means higher heat. So they basically recommend ATX or larger motherboards. But anyways, about this size, let's talk a little bit about the Silverstone Sugo 15, which is the case that I decided for this. Now, this is not your typical tiny, tiny, tiny ITX case. I mean, sure, at just under 20 liters, it's small, but you can't equate this with some of the miniaturized cases that are out there right now that do tend to cost quite a bit more. Look, first of all, it's one of the only small form factor cases that actually fits the P1 and the aluminum exterior. Well, that could actually help with heat dissipation over time. But the biggest selling point for me was one of the main reasons I wanted to try an ITX case in the first place. I thought, look, instead of using a massive case with plenty of ventilation, why not just bring the fresh air closer to the passive cooler? Well, the Sugo 15 has tons and tons of ventilation, and that should really help promote more natural convection, or at least I hope, and that's what I'm really crossing my fingers for here. It can also be placed in different orientations, which is really cool, so then you can find the best orientation for this passively cooled system. It also has handy removable panels all around for easy access, and it comes with different height feet. So if I need to, I can free up a little bit more space below the case for better ventilation. And as for the motherboard, well, I needed something with plenty of cooling to avoid VRM overheating in a system without any active airflow. So say hi to the Strix Z590i. I'm also complicating my life a little bit here with that passive GPU I talked about a little while ago. But heck, look, if I'm pushing the limits with a passive ITX system, I may as well go all in, right? Anyways, this one is actually the highest end GPU I could actually find that was passively cooled. And it's the Palette GTX 1650 COMX. And yes, I actually did buy this one from Amazon. And 
If anybody knows a faster passive card, please let me know down in the comments below. Look, I know a lot of the time these passive systems simply use the IGP and they're done with it. Well, not this one, but at the same time, I wanted integrated graphics just to see if my concept works, just in case this whole thing with the GPU goes completely sideways. So I'm using an i5-11400 here. With multi-core enhancement disabled, it's technically efficient enough to avoid temperature issues when it's used alongside the GPU. And for the power supply, I think I might have saved sort of like the best for almost last here. And I needed a completely passive power supply. And that's where this comes in. This is the Silverstone Nightjar 450 watts. Platinum certified, so it doesn't create a lot of heat. So Silverstone is actually able to passively cool it with this all metal design and the exterior heatsink. This thing, it feels like a weapon, even though it's tiny SFX size. Now, the other thing on the side, memory, crucial ballistics. Look, we had some of this floating around the office. The nice thing about it is that it's low profile enough that it can completely fit underneath this massive, massive heatsink. And look, it has RGB, I'm not gonna be using that. The final item is a crucial P5, one terabyte NVMe SSD. We use this for every single one of the builds here at the office, every single one of the test systems. It is a workhorse, so I wanted to use it in here. Now, I just wanna get on to this build. I'm gonna cross my fingers and toes that nothing goes wrong. Oh my God, if something goes wrong, the cameraman is just gonna be like, I don't wanna be here anymore. We have to troubleshoot, but either way, we're gonna start this and I'll see you on the other side. We're all cool. Oh, shit. oh, no way. You gotta be kidding me. No. Oh boy. All right, day two here. And I took a little bit of a step back to see what was going on, what the situation was here. And let me explain a little bit here. So this is one of those situations where even the best laid plans can sort of go a little bit sideways when you start installing big, huge components into a confined space or in any type of PC build for that matter. So right over here, you're actually gonna see where the ends of the heat pipes make contact with this sort of metal cage that holds the SSD caddy. So that SSD caddy is right over here and I had to remove that anyway. So we already got to that. Now you might be wondering, why don't I just pivot this cooler 45 degrees? So those heat pipes are sort of pointing towards the top of the case. Unfortunately, the cooler will actually end up going over the motherboard and hitting the top of the case and that doesn't work either. Now on the other hand, what happens if I wanna sort of pivot this 90 degrees and have the heat pipes point towards this direction? Well, they slam right into the fan grill area and that's no bueno either. The last orientation is the potential, and this is the way it actually fits into the case, is rotating it so the ends of the heat pipes point towards the bottom of the case. But in this situation, because I complicated my life, I wanted to install a GPU, that means that a GPU would not be compatible because the entire heatsink array will now go over that PCIe slot. So this is actually the only way that I can orient it in order for me to install a GPU. So what am I gonna do? All right, I'm gonna just leverage this out of here, hoping that I can actually get it out because it's such a tight fit. Anyway, so this can come out of here. Hey, hey, I didn't drop it yet. And we're gonna talk about what I'm going to do right over here. So right now, this is a blanking panel that holds that SSD caddy and it's held in place by four rivets. So two here, two way down there. My idea is to use 
a drill, my handy dandy little Ryobi over here, and drill out these rivets so I can actually remove this whole thing. I'm gonna pray to God that's not JB welded or something in place. Now the other thing that you might be wondering is what about this area here? And this is the PSU area. So I was wondering, okay, look, is there still gonna be enough support to actually hold this in place and for it not to sag? I did a little bit of back of the napkin calculations and there's actually 10 more rivets that have this whole thing secured to the rails and the case skeleton itself. So there shouldn't be any problems removing this little thing. So I'm gonna get to that right now, cross my fingers, hope this works. All right, moment of truth, no JB Weld. Oh, yes. All right, now this is exciting. It's so clean too, look at this. Perfectly drilled out. All right, next step in the process, we're actually gonna install the rest of the system in here, see if everything goes together. Not only that, this whole space now needs to be cleaned up. There is little pixie dust of metal and everything all over the place. That'll be cleaned out. We're gonna continue with the build. I can't wait, I'm so excited. Yes! All right guys, the space is cleaned up and everything else, and I also took the liberty of installing the power supply here just because there was another little concern I had. But anyways, let's bring this in because I wanted to discuss about this power supply situation just a little bit. So this is what we have right now. So the Nightjar 450 is an SFX power supply, so I needed to grab a SFX to ATX adapter for this case, but you've probably already noticed something going on here, right? This cable that comes out, the right angle cable to actually connect the power comes out right over the switch to the power supply. Luckily, you can still move it around, but man, this is a terrible design. Silverstone, fix your on this one. So anyways, the other thing I want to mention very, very quickly here is why I had a little bit of a concern, but it looks like things are gonna work. I'm gonna pop in the system in a couple seconds here, but check this out. What this adapter does between SFX and ATX here is push in the power supply just a bit, about a half inch over here. So remember those heat pipes were coming out. Now, if I had an ATX power supply, that might actually still hit. So luckily, this seems to be working. So we're gonna put the system in now. This is sort of like the moment of truth. I've, I have confidence this is gonna work anyways, but it's gonna be sort of nice to see. All right, let's bring this in, sort of wrangle it in. Oh yeah, it's gonna work. It's gonna work. There we go. There we go. Oh my goodness, with like a couple of inches to spare. Let me just jimmy this over here. Ah, there we go. Oh my God. Look at that. Look at that right there. I've got half an inch. That is the width of that ATX power supply. Score! It worked! All right, we're gonna continue the installation and see what happens. so the build is done it actually went a lot smoother than i thought it would the thing just booted up it's installing windows right now but that doesn't mean it wasn't without its challenges but before i get into that i just want to talk about how sick this thing actually looks with the noctua p1 and the passive palette comex gpu it just looks like one massive heatsink that overtakes the entire motherboard so anyways about those challenges, what ends up happening with the Noctua P1 in this orientation is that it sags a little bit. I don't know if, hopefully I'm not gonna screw anything up here, but you can actually see that a little bit here. It's just the weight of that massive heatsink. And what happened is that it actually started sitting on the GPU PCB. I was a little bit afraid of a short, so what I ended up doing is I ended up taking one of these things. It's just like an M.2 thermal pad. I stuck it on there. It gave a little bit of separation. So a little bit less worry right now. The other thing that I did is handy dandy cable management because I just wanted to make sure that all of this vertical airflow or vertical passive airflow stack was completely free of any obstructions. That was really aided by something I picked up the other day at Canada Computers, and that is these guys. So Silverstone has now launched really, really flexible ITX focused cables for their power supplies. Now the Nightjar 450, it came with this thing. Look at this, 
This thing's rigid. You can actually put it like this. And that makes cable management a little bit difficult, especially when you're trying to bundle cables away from those critical components. The last thing I did is I removed the side and bottom air filters. That's just to sort of promote a little bit more passive airflow through the case. On the other hand, I left that top dust filter there just so no dust actually settled within this case. But anyways, what I wanted to do now is that Windows is almost installed. I wanted to set this up at least with 30 minutes of load, both CPU and GPU to see if I can use this thing over the longer course of time without throttling or any type of temperature issues. Okay, so this passive system has now been running for, I guess a little bit more than 30 minutes and I can actually feel the heat rising from this. You can feel the aluminum exterior getting hot. So let's talk a little bit about the temperatures now. I've been running a loop of Cinebench R23 now for, I guess it's 38 minutes. The 11400 is actually, there's no throttling, no nothing, and it finally topped out around 80 degrees, which in some cases might sound really hot, but it is nowhere close to throttling. And not only that, it's going along at 65 watts constant. I did turn off MCE though, in order for it not to go completely crazy. The other thing I wanted to discuss very, very quickly is the VRM temperatures. Now those have been hovering right now around 67, 68, sometimes down to 66, and you're actually gonna see them sort of right down there. So right now, this thing is operating exactly the way I wanted. But the bigger question for me is what happens when I hit it with a GPU load? How quickly is that heat gonna soak through all the heat sinks and can it escape fast enough to keep everything cool? Okay, so 45 minutes later and we have success. This is, this is what I wanted. This is so exciting for me. All right, so fully passive system with a dedicated passive GPU in an ITX case. So what do we have here? So the GPU right now is operating around 82, 83 degrees and the clock speeds are cavitating between 1665 and 1755 megahertz. And what that is, is Nvidia's boost algorithms sort of kicking in to make sure that it stays between 82 and 83, but it is not going below Nvidia's boost clock. CPU on the other hand, 80, 81, this is Jedi Fallen Order. It is pretty CPU intensive as well. So no throttling, no nothing here. That is exactly what I wanted. Now, there's another thing that I wanted to mention here is what is ambient temperatures? Because ambient temperatures play such a huge role when it comes to passive systems. Of course, it's drawing in that ambient air and through convection, exhausting it out the top. And again here, it's boiling hot. So if you are in an environment that is warm, this kind of system is probably not going to be for you. But what happens right now with our noise floor in this space is around 30, three, 34 decibels. What happens if I add a fan that doesn't go above ambient noise levels? And I know all of you passive people out there are gonna say, oh my God, well, it's not passive anywhere. Well, no, it won't be, but it won't go above the ambient noise. So where am I gonna put this thing? And I'm gonna show you guys this right now. If you open this up, Silverstone has a bracket that goes right in this area. And I have a 15 millimeter high Scythe Kaze fan that I mounted to this bracket. This we're gonna be running at around 600 RPMs, which gives us our minimum noise floor. And basically, I wanna see exactly what's gonna happen here and if it's worth adding just a little bit of airflow into here. All right, I complicated my life, guys. This is pretty mind blowing. So let me explain to you what's happening. Right now, the CPU is operating 20 degrees lower than it was before, but that GPU, it's actually starting to throttle just a little bit because it's going to 86, 87 degrees. What's happening, I think, is that that additional airflow here is actually pushing through the P1 and the GPU is actually munching down on some of that hot air that's being produced by the processor. So it's going up. Look, I know that I can probably test this until the cows come home. I might actually continue testing this, but this pretty much concludes this video because this system is now gonna be living in my house. I'm gonna be modifying it, gonna be trying a couple of other things, but man oh man, this was such an exciting journey. My first passive PC, I'm so happy with it. It's working, actually it will be passive once I take out this fan because I was a lot happier with the GPU temperatures without the fan in there. Anyways, I really hope you guys enjoyed this. This one was a pleasure to work on. Couple of little issues, but in the end, 
We pulled it out. I love it. I hope you guys too. I'll see you guys in the next one, maybe with a couple modifications to this case. Have a good one, guys.